Um, and then you can start seeing this is a, a, a lot of biomass. We usually have much less material that is formed in this. We use an IR microscope. The IR microscope is a very sensitive technology that couples the micro, uh, a, bench, uh, mic, uh, a bench IR with a very sensitive microscope that it has a very powerful detector. And what we're going to do is we're going to use, we basically place the membrane in, in the stage and we're going to use ATR. Now you know what ATR, okay? So what do we need to do with this in order to get uh, a signal? I'm not going to be the only one talking. What do you think? This is made of germanium. It's a, it's, it's a crystal that is going to create that evanescence wave. So we're going to put this in uh, a slide in this place, and then we raise the stage until we have a contact with our material. We just need to touch it. If we touch the, the, the biomass, we have a signal. Okay, so it's, it's, this is basically what we see. This is biomass trapped and have grown in that hydrophobic grid. And then we use this to center where we want to collect the spectra and we touch it. Very simple, very easy. And we have used it to identify, we have done research on salmonella, E. coli and Listeria. And we have really nice models that differentiate them. In this case, this is Salmonella. And we also look at the effect of time of growing. You remember, we took the, the filter, put it in an agar, and waited for it to grow. We took samples at 8, 16, and 24 hours. And what you can see is that after 24 hours, we have much tighter clusters. Our predictive ability to identify this bacteria is much stronger, okay? Um, what happened is that bacteria has three phases of growth. It's going to have a lag time, it has an exponential time, and it has a stationary phase. During the exponential time, you're going to have different populations growing in your sample. You have some bacteria that is going to grow much slower, some others that are going to be growing much faster. We can see those differences. So we're going to have, because we have different populations, our spectra is not going to be able to resolve it very well. In the stationary phase, most of the bacteria are homogeneous. So we can get much better clustering. But then another really nice advantage of pirouette or chemometrics, if you use Simca, is the discriminating power. The discriminating power is a function that uses, um, that is going to look at which one of those frequencies is associated with the clustering. So it provides weights to each one of these frequencies and is going to look which one is going to give you a higher weight in explaining that clustering. What we did was use that discriminating power and we found that there was a major band associated with the discrimination. The really nice thing with mean infrared and fundamental vibration is that we can go to the literature and we can go and say, okay, 981, what is associated with 981? What has been previously reported in those bands? And what we found is was, it was a typical band with lipopolysaccharides. So we went back and said, is there lipopolysaccharides in Salmonella? And actually there is. The envelope in the bacteria 
is lipopolysaccharides. And these different serovars are going to have different levels of lipopro these lipopolysaccharides in that envelope. So we have been the first ones to report that our discrimination for this bacteria was associated with lipopolysaccharides in the membranes of this bacteria. Another technique that we're using is actually called immunomagnetic uh, separation. What we have is we can use immunomagnetic beads. Um, We buy this, but I have learned that you might be able to produce them. Uh, I was today in Imbrapa, and they, they, um, one of the professors was saying that they can actually make gold uh, or magnetic particles uh, for tagging. So what we do is we, we have these magnetic beads that have an antibody. And if we have the antigen, they will bind. And then we use a magnet. And everything that has reacted with our antibody binds the, the, the magnet. So what we do is then we throw away the liquid. Everything that didn't bind, we wash a couple of times, use the magnet again, discard the supernatant, and analyze the, the, the beads. And what we have done is this is how it looks in the, in, in the back you're going to have all the beads that are magnetized. And it's a very strong magnet. So we can isolate the target, um, anything that has reacted with our beads. And we did that with Salmonella. Again, we use our microscope. And what we found is that after eight hours of incubation, we have already enough signal to differentiate between our control beads and salmonella that has reacted with our, uh, with our beads so that we have an antigen, antibody antigen reaction, okay? Now, after 24 hours of incubation, we have a much better discrimination. But why, why do you think we have such a large cluster here? I was actually anticipating to have a very small cluster, but it was a broad cluster. What we have found is that the different serovars from Salmonella are going to be interacting differently with these antibodies. Okay? So we can actually see that effect also with the IR. Now, you remember here we said that we can identify or, or characterize salmonella at the serovar level with this band. Now we have this band, okay? What happens is that this is an amide band. It's a protein interaction. So what we're actually seeing here is once your salmonella has interacted with your antibody, is going to change the signal. So what we're looking is at a signal that is telling us we have salmonella that have bound to our beads. We cannot get information for identification of specific serovars because the beads have a strong signal in the fingerprint. We cannot see that, that, that information. But we can get information about ligation. Uh, another application, this is one that we have in quality control. Um, I work a lot with snacks. Um, in my lab, you're always going to find potato chips, tortilla chips, uh, we have Cheetos. Uh, we work a lot with, uh, that's one of the perks of working with food science. You always have food around. Uh, so. We had a project with potato chips, and it started with, can we determine moisture and, um, and fat? Moisture and fat, two very important. 
The moisture in a potato chip is about 2%. Uh, the fat in a potato chip is about 30%. So it's a lot of fat in a potato chip. 30% of its weight is fat. So we, we did, uh, we had, this is the reduced fat potato chips, have about 18%. And these are the real tasty <laughs> potato chips with about 45, these are the higher level. So, um, and these are the, the range of moisture that we found. So we were able to develop nice regressions with near infrared and mid infrared. Both of them work really well. Near infrared is much easier to use. Mid infrared is a little bit more, uh, you need to homogenize really well, okay? With near infrared, it's, it's more forgiving if you don't have a really well homogenized sample. Um, but then we wanted to see about the oil. So my, you know, this is the, the perks of having very smart people working with you. You can take a little bit of the credit, uh, but they do a lot of the work. And she said, what about if we look at the fat? So she took the, the potato chips, press it, okay? Once you press the potato chip, fat is going to be expelled. So she took a little bit of that fat that was expelled, put it in a near infrared or in a mid infrared. So what we found first was that there was this number 14 in both near infrared and mid infrared it was an unusual sample. Second, we found that with the mid infrared, we can isolate each sample by its oil. With the near infrared, we didn't have that definition. So that was the first, uh, with, with classification, usually mid infrared is going to give you better signal than near infrared. Now, what about this 14? I said, look at your spectra. What is the discriminating power? Because it has to be associated with this sample. So we look at the mid infrared. This was the major sample, the major peak that was discriminating. And it was, uh, was associated with a trans fat. So it was the only sample that we use that used partially hydrogenated soybean oil. And when you do partially hydrogenation of oil, you're going to develop trans fats, okay? Trans fats have been associated with higher increase in heart disease. It, low, it increases the LDL, lowers your HDL, and is going to form more plaque than saturated fat. So this was, this sample, Number 14 was, had a higher level. Well, it had trans fat. The others didn't. Okay? So very simple. Do you know where else we find trans fats? The ones that took the class should know. Huh? Baked goods, yes. Margarine. Okay? But the good margarine, not the one that Polly brings. <laughs> we tried a margarine and she chose the only one that didn't have trans fat. So we couldn't see it. But um, another thing that we did was we expressed the oil and then we used pure oil. Okay? And this is pure oil. Okay? So these samples, these three samples, were fried with peanut oil. These two samples were fried with cottonseed oil. This sample here was fried with sunflower, sunflower oil. Now, you see these ones that are in the middle. We look at the labeling, and it said this. It may contain one or more of the following, corn, cottonseed, and sunflower. Do you see where it is? It's between the corn, the cotton seed, and the sunflower. So they mixed 
oil for frying. And we can actually tell that by using this modeling. So very powerful. Um, other applications that we're looking is we're trying to look at incoming material, especially we're working at reducing sugars. Um, we're working with oils, trying to predict um, quality traits, especially associated with oxidation or rancidity. Uh, we're working a lot with trans. I'm going to show you some, some research that we have done with acrylamide. And we're working a lot uh, with functional uh, properties, especially with potatoes. Um, detection of contaminants. That's another area that we're working a lot. Um, after the melamine, do you know what was the melamine incident? You know, but the melamine incident, they found melamine in pet food, actually in the corn meal. Melamine is a um, very rich molecule in nitrogen, okay? So it was used to boost nitrogen levels. The corn meal is paid based on nitrogen levels. So if you add this melamine, you increase the nitrogen content, you get more money, okay? So what happened? A person in China added melamine to the cornmeal. And they sold the cornmeal to the United States. Cornmeal is a major ingredient in pet food manufacturing. And they were using this pet food for premium uh, pet food. What they found is that Cats and dogs started to have very serious illnesses. Some of the pets died because of this. And what happened was that in the contamination, they don't, didn't use only melamine. They used melamine and cyanuric acid because it was actually what it was, the waste stream of the formation of plastics using melamine. And what happened with, if you have melamine and you have cyanuric acid under the conditions of your kidney, they form a crystal. So these crystals completely blocked the renal tubes leading to illnesses, really serious illnesses or death, okay? 